I've just walked out of our hostel and there's an almighty traffic jam in the road outside. Uh, We're here with the uh, girls from the UN school uh, who are all uh, residents of the Haitia refugee camp. Um, because uh, there's little attention paid to the camp uh, and the schools and the medical centers, uh, kids have to go to school in two ships. There's not enough rooms for them. Uh, there's not enough supplies. Um, so today the girls' school has walked out and blocked traffic. Also, education is very, very important in Palestine. Um, it's, it's highly, highly, highly valued. So you can see why it seems as though there's lots of community support. While we were in Bethlehem, we stayed at the Ibda Center, which is in the Daisha refugee camp on the Hebron Road. Thousands of people live in one square kilometer block, still supported by the UN. A display of old photographs on the walls of the center explained the history of the camp. After having betrayed the Arabs at the end of the First World War, Lawrence of Arabia all, and all that, the British were running Palestine up until about 1948. When the army was clearing Palestinian villages, the inhabitants of four to six villages were driven eastwards and they were finally accommodated by the UN at um, an area of land here which is called Daisha Camp. At first the people would have been accommodated in a tented village, rather like this one. But by the 1950s, uh, the tents were being replaced by concrete rectangular huts, as you can see in this photograph. And on our tour around the refugee camp, some of those huts remain to this day. In the late 80s, um, the Israelis uh, fenced off the camp as a collective punishment, an enormously high wire fence, subjected to uh, constant military patrols. And the only way in and out of the camp was through this one metal turnstile. Here's a photograph of um, young Palestinian men being arrested by soldiers. It's a colour photograph, so it must be fairly recent. Although eventually the Palestinians won and ripped down the fence, they kept the turnstile, which must have been a hated symbol of their uh, imprisonment, has been kept as a monument outside the hostel where we're staying. We were given a guided tour around the camp. Now, lots of houses crammed in around narrow roads and passageways. One thing that particularly aggrieves them, struggling to cope as refugees in such overcrowded living conditions, is knowing that some of the lands their families were cleared from is now empty and have been turned into national parks. We were also told of the heroic resistance during the Intifadas and the Israeli policy of house demolitions for wrongdoers, which punishes whole families and neighbours. We were told of the 13 martyrs from the camp, the saddest cases being a 12-year-old boy shot dead while sitting outside his house and a 13-year-old girl shot through the head while looking out of her window. The word martyr is often misinterpreted by the Western media. The Palestinian word, shahid, means anyone, civilian or resistance fighter, whose suffering or death bears witness to the injustice of the occupation. The walls round the camp are covered with graffiti, pictures of the dead, revolutionary leaders, inspirational murals and sinister bullet holes. Although we saw many hardcore resistance posters on the walls and in the shops, I think every Palestinian I met was, contrary to the popular image, remarkably forgiving and peace-loving. We read in the papers of a little 12-year-old boy, Ahmed, one of the many men, women and children being killed daily by the Israeli army or the settlers. His parents donated his organs to be used by Israeli families. Violence against violence is worthless, said his parents. Maybe this will reach the ears of the world so they can distinguish between just and unjust. Maybe the Israelis will think differently of us. Maybe next time, just one soldier will decide not to shoot. The walls of the Ibda hostel are decorated with murals to the suffering of the families who were ethnically cleansed from their land in 1948. The house keys in some of the murals 
are symbols that they have the legal right to return to their original homes. The centre provides education, social and community projects, including a cafe and embroidery production. It raises funds and provides an invaluable internet cafe for the young people. I recommend staying here so you can boast your mates who lived in a refugee camp. Actually, it's a very nice comfortable hostel. But all too soon we were packing our bags again and setting off for our second week's olive picking, this time in the town of Marda. Again we travelled back north and you can see from the UN map that the separation or apartheid wall, which if it should be anywhere should follow the UN Green Line, actually plunges 20 kilometres, some 12 miles, inside the West Bank. The town of Marda itself is trapped on a strip of land between the settlement of Ariel and the new settler road. Here you see the settlement of Ariel. It's one of the largest settlements in the West Bank. The white line under it is where they are going to build the, the apartheid wall. Here they are paving uh, the way to build fence right on side of the road. So Mana will have the wall on the one side and the fence that's supposedly protecting the settler road on the other side. So it will be fenced in from all sides. The first thing you notice as you approach the town is the Israeli settlements have proper road signs to them. But the sign from Marda, which was in fact put up by intergovernmental aid organisations, has had the panel with the name Marda knocked out and thrown on the ground. While we were in Marda, every day, from dawn to dusk, machines were grinding away on the hillside. You should also be aware the Church of England, among others, has shares in the company Caterpillar. And this was the second of their diggers I photographed, which was working on the separation wall. All this was destroying more of the farmers' olive trees, and cutting off even more of their land on the far side of the wall. We were told of instances when farmers had been attacked by settlers who beat them and stole their olives, and of other farmers who'd had tear gas fired at them. The farmers we were picking with had been afraid to go to their olive groves near the fence for over a month before we arrived. Crossing the construction zone was tricky. The rocks and earth all torn apart by the diggers and the blasting work was a horrible sight. Once into the olive groves above the construction zone, we spread out. By this time next year, this section of the wall will be finished, and this land will be absorbed into the settlement of Ariel. At least we were helping the farmers to get their last crop harvested from these trees before they were cut off. We were also joined by a similar group from Austria. It was interesting but distressing to hear of their different set of experiences, being ordered out of the field by soldiers at gunpoint and witnessing distressing raids on people's houses. Our work was punctuated by the usual picnics in the fields. And as an added treat, this time we could enjoy fresh sage tea. I interviewed one of the farmers whose land was being destroyed. Mm. Chocolate. Alpha. 